Welcome, everyone. Uh, we are about to have a Robotics Masters online open house information session. Uh, looks like we have 11 viewers joining us. I'm, I'm glad you could make it. Uh, after, the, after I give a few remarks, um, we're going to open things up for questions as well. So uh, first, let me take this a second to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Noah Cowan. I'm an associate professor of mechanical engineering, and I have uh, joint appointments in electrical and computer engineering, computer science, and neuroscience. And uh, my job uh, today, my, I'm, I'm talking to you in my capacity as the deputy director for the Laboratory for Computational Sensing Robotics. And in that capacity, I also direct the master's program in robotics here at Johns Hopkins. And with me today, I have a student, uh, Christine Opikin. Opikin. Um, uh, who joined our program uh, last year, and she's going to give you a few uh, words today about herself, and then, and then as time progresses, she'll tell you about uh, the program from a student's perspective. Yeah. So um, let's see. So uh, first, let me tell you a little bit about the institution uh, of Johns Hopkins University, uh, because that'll give you a sense of the ecosystem in which the master's program resides. Um, Johns Hopkins is uh, the U.S.'s oldest Ph.D. granting institution, um, and for the last 30-plus uh, years, we've actually led the United States in uh, research expenditures funded by the U.S. government, uh, topping uh, $2 billion in fiscal year 2014. Those are the most recent numbers that I have. Um, and there are nine divisions, um, including but not limited to the Applied Physics Laboratory, the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, the Bloomberg School of Public Health, uh, uh, the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences, and of course the Whiting School of Engineering. So within Johns Hopkins is the Whiting School of Engineering. Um, that's the sub-ecosystem in which uh, you will uh, complete the master's program should you come. And uh, this picture here is of the, one of the Whiting School uh, quadrangles um, is a typical walk. In fact, I took this walk this morning when I came back to get coffee uh, from getting coffee before I started this webinar. Um, so uh, we have, in the Whiting School of Engineering, we have uh, nine PhD programs. Those would be programs in, for example, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, robotics, computer science, uh, biomedical engineering, uh, chemical and biomolecular engineering, and so on. We also have 14 master's programs and 20 part-time master's programs, uh, the robotics program being among the full-time master's programs. Um, we have a lot of students, both undergraduate and graduate, as you see here, uh, almost 200 faculty, uh, about 200 faculty, uh, over 200 faculty, and you count uh, what we call academic or tenure line faculty, as well as research faculty and teaching faculty. And then there are also a large number of associated research scientists and engineers who play a vital role in uh, research on campus. The Laboratory for Computational Sensing and Robotics was founded in 2007. I got here in 2003, and, and uh, during, when, I, when I got here, there was something called an Engineering Research Center, which was a really large engineering center um, to the tune of $50 million funded by the National Science Foundation that really helped to uh, establish Hopkins as an international leader in robotics and in medical robotics in particular at that time. And then in 2007, uh, the uh, LCSR was founded as the graduation, as part of the graduation plan for this engineering research center, and uh, we have continued to grow since then and continue to, to expand our operations beyond medicine uh, and beyond medical robotics. To now, we're spending about five million dollars a year in in um, total spending, most of which is uh, research spending, and we have collaborations worldwide, uh, both academic and uh, both. Well, first of all, within Johns Hopkins. So one of the things that I mentioned earlier is that. The medical, sorry, the engineering uh, school sits within this larger ecosystem of the med school, the applied physics laboratory, um, uh, space science telescope institute, and so on. And so there's lots of opportunities for collaboration within Johns Hopkins. And as well, many of us have collaborations at academic institutions worldwide. This is just a very small list of those um, uh, collaborations, as well as uh, industrial collaborations. Um, some major companies listed there, but there's many, many, many more uh, beyond that. Um, we have, uh, within the robotics program, we have uh, 21 uh, engineering faculty uh, affiliated with the center, about 10 of which are resident faculty that sit in Hackerman Hall, um, five to 10 postdocs, 30 master's students, and about 40 PhD students. Uh, and that number uh, continues uh, to grow. Now, 
research is really important, and I'll come back to that um, in a little bit, but for the master's program, the bulk of what you would do is take uh, courses, uh, and the um, all master's students will take uh, eight courses. Two are core courses that we've selected. One is a mechanical engineering course, and one is a computer science course. We work with the mechanical engineering and computer science department uh, to make sure those courses are fulfilled. In fact, I typically teach the mechanical engineering course for the last few years, um, and so we, we, we always make sure that these classes are um, uh, uh, organized in such a way to allow our students uh, in the master's program in robotics to take them. Um, and then you'll select uh, courses to fill one of six uh, tracks. I'll talk a bit more about the tracks in a minute. Um, and then, and of those eight courses, at least four have to be at the advanced graduate level. Uh, four can be at the um, uh, senior undergraduate level slash uh, uh, beginning graduate level. And that's actually a really useful feature of a multidisciplinary program like ours because many students might come in with a strong mechanical engineering background but be a little bit weak in computer science where they can pick some of that computer science up at the advanced undergraduate level. And, and vice versa, you might come in with a, a strong background uh, in, with, let's say, in computer science and lack maybe some of the basic mechanics. And you can take some of our upper division undergraduate courses uh, to shore up that before venturing uh, into the deep end of the advanced graduate courses. And if you take the coursework option, which is, I would say, roughly half to two thirds of our students take the coursework option, um, uh, you would take two more advanced graduate courses. And, and I should mention that even the students that do that, a significant fraction of them do get involved in research in some way. Um, and then the other option is to complete a, a research essay, a complete research and write uh, an essay, and uh, that replaces two of your courses. I can't say that it actually is a zero sum game. If you take the essay option, you're probably gonna spend more time in terms of the number of hours that you spend toward your master's. Probably not a lot more time in terms of the calendar years because you'll be able to hopefully take, do a significant fraction of your research in the summer between your first and second year. Um, and so it uh, might extend your work into the uh, fourth semester, but certainly not uh, beyond if you're diligent. Um, and I think it's, it's reasonable to try to wrap things up uh, in a year and a half, even doing the essay. Um, most students do not complete the degree in one year unless they're Johns Hopkins undergraduates, where they're allowed to double count two courses. Most students require at least three semesters to complete the degree. Um, and a significant minority of our students would take a fourth semester, one extra class, and a part-time uh, pay grade, pay scale. Um, and so it's uh, just important to know kind of what you're getting into. It's a, it's a very rigorous program. It's not sort of a, um, um, a quick in and out program. It's a serious embedded one and a half year master's program. And um, uh, that's why it says that the time deadline to completion is one and a half to two years. It's very reasonable to complete it in one and a half years. Although, as I said, a, uh, a significant minority do take an extra term to, to wrap up the last course or two. Um, now, uh, I mentioned that you know, uh, the primary mission of the LCSR when it was founded was research. And we've since added uh, two minors and a master's degree. And the, but the master's degree really take advantage of the research areas and the research expertise that we have. Uh, and this is one example. In, in addition to having the option to do a research essay, we structure our six academic tracks based on our research strengths. And so, uh, we as faculty have our own disciplinary expertise and we offer courses that are in that disciplinary expertise. For example, I offer courses in biorobotics. Um, uh, Russ Taylor and uh, Greg Hager might offer courses in medical robotics um, and so on. And so that we, these are specialized graduate courses that are in the faculty's disciplinary areas of expertise allowing you to take advantage of the world-class research knowledge that we've accumulated here at Johns Hopkins, but in an academic setting. Um, this is above and beyond uh, any research that we, we would do. We're not above and beyond. This is sort of the foundation, actually, for any research that you would do, is this, is this academic coursework in, these, uh, in one of these tracks. So, um, and then we also have this general robotics track for, um, that gives you a little bit more flexibility in, in hand-picking the courses that you would take with your advisor. Uh, because you might have very specific interests that you want to fulfill that might not fit with when, with neatly within one of our other five tracks. Um, and so that provides a little bit of flexibility. But if you really want to become an expert in perceptual and cognitive systems, we've set up a palette of options um, to make that uh, e easier for you. We have a lot of research in LCSR. As I mentioned, it's on the order of uh, four, over $4 million annual expenditure uh, within the center. 
Um, and this can be very roughly divided into four areas, um, although this is a simplification. Um, certainly, we're most well known worldwide for our medical robotics research, uh, but we're also very well known for our robotics in extreme environments. For example, uh, Professor Whitcomb uh, just uh, sent uh, a robotic um, underwater vehicle uh, under the Arctic ice cap, um, which is obviously a very extreme environment. That's a very exciting uh, mission that he just went on. So he does deep sea underwater robotics. We also do space robotics. I would actually argue that medical robotics is an extreme environment, the human body. Um, myself and uh, uh, Dr. Chen Li, me, Dr. Chen Li, and um, uh, new, new incoming faculty, Jeremy Brown, do, do work in neuromechanics and bioinspired robotics. Um, uh, there's also a lot of work on human machine interactive systems. And um, these are just a few of the areas that we cover. I'll tell you a little bit more, since I'm giving the talk here, a little bit more about my research in particular, uh, in case you're interested, just to give you a little perspective of where I'm coming from. I'm actually what you might call an inverse roboticist. So I got my start studying robotics and in the classical sense, like you'll learn in, in your courses, but have since transitioned to the problem of trying to understand uh, how animals work, but taking a robotic point of view. So I'm obviously not designing the animals. The animals were um, designed, if you will, through evolution. And many of them can achieve behaviors that we can only dream of as of yet in robotics. And so uh, my laboratory takes the approach of thinking about the whole organism like you would do in an integrative biology department, but using the mathematical and engineering tools that we use in robotics to try to understand the mathematical and dynamical underpinnings of neurocontrolled locomotion. And so there's just a few projects that, uh, that I won't spend too much time on, but one of them is on um, uh, uh, it's trying to understand how under innervated organ, so it's unlike a whisker that doesn't have any sensing in it, it actually has sensation all along the length, um, and it can run along a wall at something like a meter and a half a second, um, which if you think about the fact that the cockroach is only this long, it's running something uh, on the order of 20 body lengths a second, roughly um, in the dark, using a feeler that's only as long as it is and not running into the wall while it does it. And it would be something like running the 100 meter dash in about a second with a floppy feeler out in front of you and trying not to run into the wall. And it's amazing that they're able to do this. It's probably one of the best uh, examples of a sensory motor control system in nature in terms of the bandwidth of that system. And so one of the interesting things that we found was not in the, um, oh, just playing the wrong video. That's a cool video too, but I'm gonna show this one first. But one of the things that we found was that all along the length of the antenna, there are these tiny little micro spines, and hopefully you can see my pointer, but if not, look at the video and you see those spines on this robotic antenna that engage in the surface and help the antenna right itself relative to the substrate. And uh, we were able to figure this out by making a robotic antenna on the one hand, but also uh, our colleagues at UC Berkeley were able to laser ablate the hairs off of the end of the cockroach antenna so we can do these comparative experiments between the biomechanics and the robotics. Um, another experiment uh, that got started while I was a, uh, on sabbatical a few years ago doing some research at the University of Washington with uh, a renowned neuromechanist there studying moth flight and I'll just show you this video. This is a moth tethered to a stick and we're moving a visual scene up and down, and that's represented by those black stripes. You can't see the visual scene, it's outside the field of view. And as we move those stripes up and down, the, math, the moth waggles its abdomen up and down. And because the moth's abdomen is very heavy, that has the effect of uh, reorienting the thorax of the moth. The thorax is the middle section. Every insect has three segments. It's the thorax is the middle segment, and the middle segment has the, the wings on it. And so if you reorient using conservation of angular momentum, if you re reorient the thing that has the wings, you're also redirecting the aerodynamic forces. So I wrote down a simple mathematical model that explained how that vision motor transform might be used to help stabilize flight. And as a proof of concept, we did the same thing on a quadcopter. And here's the quadcopter without our abdominal controller turned on. And here's a quadcopter with our abdominal controller turned on. And you can see our little abdomen there, which is just a battery pack attached to a, to a um, servo motor, was able to stabilize uh, pitch in the same way that we think that the moths do. And then um, lastly, and I'll, uh, I'll refer you to our papers to look at this, we had a, a really fun paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science that investigated the uh, ribbon fin locomotion in the knife fish um, using a biorobotic model system in collaboration with our colleagues at Northwestern University and using computational modeling as well. 
So, um, and with that, I want to turn it over to Christy so she can tell you a little bit about the student experience here in the master's program. Hi, everyone. As Noah said, I'm Christy O'Pekin, and I am a third semester master's student here in the robotics MSU program at Johns Hopkins. Um, and first, I want to give you a little bit about my background. So I graduated from the University of Maryland with a degree in mechanical engineering. And after graduation, I went straight on to industry and worked in industry for a year. Now, I decided that I really wanted to be more involved with cutting edge technology and really we're better to do that than robotics. So when I was looking at schools, what really drew me to Hopkins was the strength of their program. I mean, not only is Hopkins a university that's known worldwide, but also the robotics program is one of the top 10 in the world. So when I came to visit, it became evident that not only is the program very well organized and the um, the administrative staff is very, very friendly and very available to help you out when you're trying to navigate the program. But I think one of the things that drew me the most is just the sheer diversity of robotics research that's being performed here. Um, so on this slide, you can see this is a picture of the Robotorium. And a, a big majority of our robotic-specific research is performed in this space. And what's really cool about that is you can go down, and in one lab, they're doing uh, bio-inspired mobile robotics, and then you go to the next lab and they're doing surgical robotics and augmented reality and VR, and just all of this is being done in this one space, which really engenders a collaborative environment and makes it a really good place for communication and a great learning experience. Um, so last semester, I was able to get involved with research with uh, Professor Chen Li, who was a new professor at the time. And what was really exciting about that is the lab hadn't even been started. So I got to be part of the group that brought in all the equipment and set up the lab and um, was one of the people who worked on some of the original projects in the lab. And so I got to uh, work on a project where we observed cockroaches and looked at their behavior, um, which allowed them to get over rough terrain much better because our robots don't do that very well right now, and then built little robots to try and um, better define those characteristics to help us understand how cockroaches, the behavior that the cockroaches show, better help the cockroaches move over the terrain. And so that's a really cool um, thing that I got to do and I really enjoyed it. So that's something that hopefully you'll be able to get involved with while you're here. Um, outside of academics and research, uh, Johns Hopkins is a really diverse university um, in activities that students are interested in. So um, I think just like a lot of universities, there's many student groups that you can get involved with from outdoor activities to acapella. Um, but Johns Hopkins and the robotics program boast a diversity of students from not only all over the US, but also all over the world. And um, so there are student groups to represent that. And I think it was really exciting. I got to go with some of my friends to a spring fair celebration. And I think yesterday they had a Diwali celebration. So not only are you learning all of this really cool stuff about robotics, but you kind of get a little bit of cultural learning from just the students that are here. Um, and then Johns Hopkins is located in Baltimore. And Baltimore really is a happy city. It's a lot of cool things are going on here. Um, people are very friendly. Um, Baltimore has a great arts cultural history. So um, MICO, which is a, a institute for art, is down here. And they have a lot of open houses that you can go to see art that the students are doing there. Uh, Peabody is uh, part of the Johns Hopkins community. And they put on free concerts for students. Um, there's a lot of cool things to see in Baltimore, the Inner Harbor. Um, and they have festivals almost every weekend that you can go and see um, for different things. And um, not only does Baltimore have all of these really cool things going on, but Baltimore has uh, started to become a really great hub for small businesses. Um, so we have a lot of small uh, medical device manufacturers and engineering companies that are located right here in Baltimore. So not only is Baltimore pretty close to DC where there's a great job market, but there's also a, a local job market right here, which is great because once you get your degree, then you don't even have to go very far to look for, um, for jobs. And a lot of jobs come from Johns Hopkins and Johns Hopkins has a great interface with the engineering com uh, company community in this area. And so I think that's really helpful for all the students. 
So uh, if you guys have any more questions during the question and answer section, um, I'm happy to answer any other questions that you have about the student experience. Thanks, Christy. So a natural question that one might ask is uh, where are students go after they graduate from Johns Hopkins. So first of all, a fair uh, number of them actually stay on for a PhD in one of our PhD um, programs. The robotics program does not offer a PhD and that was actually, this is actually um, by choice. We think that there's a really great market for master's graduates in robotics, uh, but there's not yet as big of a demand for PhDs in robotics. And um, there is a big, because mo you know, the, the most people that are looking for PhDs are um, things like academic institutions and um, so forth that would be looking for uh, traditional PhDs to fill traditional roles uh, in, in their respective disciplines. Um, and while that market may eventually grow, and we would certainly adapt to meet that changing demand, we think that the master's program already, there's a big demand for master's students. Um, so once the master's, once you're here and you're doing your master's degree, if, uh, if you're really thriving in our program and you identify somebody that you'd like to do research with, then uh, um, uh, asking if they're interested in, in uh, having you stay on as a PhD student is a really good thing. I actually have two PhD students in my lab. Well, actually one's now a, a postdoc with another group, um, but I've had two recent PhD students in my lab that were from the master's program. They happen to be from the master's program in mechanical engineering, but the principle is the same. Um, we don't, once you're here, make a really big distinction between the different student pools. In hack, I mean, the great thing about an interdisciplinary program like robotics is we have computer science, mechanical engineers, bio, biomedical engineers, electrical engineers, robotics master students, and so on, all under one roof, and uh, uh, they're all part of the same family. So those that do go the academic track, uh, many of them are now faculty um, around the world at the institutions uh, listed here. Um, and then uh, those that decide both with PhD or with master's degree that their calling is in industry um, uh, have gone to many of the companies that are, uh, all of the companies that are listed here are represented by our students these days, uh, as well as others. Um, and just to name a few, Intuitive Surgical, they're the makers of the um, medical robot that you might know of called the Da Vinci Surgical System. I think we have three in-house of those machines. Um, so that's a good opportunity for uh, medical robotics research. Um, uh, Siemens, Philips, uh, NIH, Medtronic, and so on. There's a lot of really exciting uh, places um, uh, that, that hopefully you recognize a great majority of them. Uh, and so now that you're hooked and you want to come to Johns Hopkins, how do you apply? Um, well, it's not different than most other graduate programs. We want a statement of purpose, a transcript, a GRE. If you're an international student, uh, you need to take one of the uh, tests designed for international students. Um, and uh, I should mention that it's not about being, you know, getting a super high score on these tests. We have a sufficiency, we list a minimum requirement that you must achieve. And the reason for that is because we don't think it's a kindness to let students into the program who would struggle to try to just understand what the instructors are saying. And so getting above that is icing on the cake, but it's not, it doesn't really help your application in any significant way. We want to know that you're prepared to uh, learn in English. Beyond that, it's, it, it's just it's just a sufficiency. Uh, and then three letters of reference. So that beyond achieving the minimum uh, score on these, on one of these international uh, uh, language exams, the main things that we care about are your letters of reference, your GRE, your transcript, uh, and then what helps you put those things in context uh, is your statement of purpose. So the statement of purpose is not something that you need to feel, uh, you know, really sweat over. Keep it short, keep it simple. Use it as an opportunity to explain problems in your academic record if there's a, if there's a legitimate reason for it. For example, you might have had a death or an illness, a death in the family or an illness, um, a personal illness that really set you back one year, or one semester, it really hurt your grades. And if you can point to that in your, in your um, statement of purpose, that helps us try to understand and take that into consideration. Maybe give us a different way to dig a little deeper into your application. Uh, there is no minimum for any of these um, uh, things like the GRE or your uh, GPA. There's no minimum. Uh, it is reasonable to know like what's a reasonable score on these things to get. And I would say that 
in I I know of no cases of students, for example, uh, that are on the 4.0 grading system that have gotten less than a 3.0 and been admitted into the program. Um, uh, I'd say it's more common that they have a GPA 3.4 or above, but there's certainly room for that's not a hard line. There can be lots of good reasons why a student has less than the 3.4. They have excellent letters, strong GRE. Maybe they, they uh, uh, got some really exciting industrial experience, some other aspect of their uh, academic record that makes it clear to us that they're gonna succeed in this very rigorous academic program. We're not trying to keep people out. We just wanna admit people that we're sure can succeed. And so uh, it's not a kindness to let somebody in the program if they're not gonna do well. And so if you're admitted to our program, it's because we believe that you're gonna be able to succeed uh, in our program. Uh, and um, uh, so that's all I'll say about the application uh, process. Um, and I guess at this point, I'd like to just open it up for uh, questions. I don't see any yet posted, but if you go to the Q&A section of the app, uh, of the uh, webinar app, uh, you can see there's an opportunity for you to post uh, questions. And with 14 of you, I hope we have some questions. Okay, here we have one. Um, let me, I'm gonna uh, hit answer live to make sure everybody can see, because I'm not sure if you can see unless I'm answering. So this, the question is, uh, there is a robotics track of MSc in mechanical engineering department. This is a really good question. Uh, you also mentioned that two of your students are from ME. Can you explain the major differences between MSc and robotics and, and the uh, MSc, the MSc in mechanical engineering with robotic focus? That's actually an excellent question. Um, I think it's a matter of taste in some ways. Many of the students in mechanical engineering uh, end up taking many of the same courses that are in robotics. Um, the one thing that I'll say that is different is that uh, the ME program in robotics is um, um, not quite as multidisciplinary in its structure. Uh, because you have to fulfill a larger number of mechanical engineering courses. And so if you really want the mechanical engineering side of robotics and, and, and that's really your interest, then mechanical engineering may be better for you. But if you want to use this as an opportunity to become a little bit broader in your training, like say you already have a mechanical engineering degree and now you want to get gain breadth, then I would say that the, the robotics master's degree may be a better choice. But I advise both kinds of students, and they take many of the same classes, and both are really good options. And so I don't want to say that one is really better than the other. It's largely a matter of taste. Um, I'll answer this one here. So I have another question. Uh, please explain the underlying differences between uh, artificial intelligence, embedded systems engineering, and robotics MSc program. So um, AI isn't a program. Uh, I'm not exactly sure I understand this question. So you know, I'm gonna uh, ask um, Rushi if you could please um, rephrase your question. AI, there are courses in AI, there are courses in embedded systems, and then the robotic master's degree is, a pro is an entire program. So I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. Maybe you can clarify. Do we have any more questions? I hope so. Uh, here we have a question. So um, is it possible to join the PhD program directly after a bachelor's degree? Is there any special procedure for this? So first let me remind you that there is no PhD program in robotics. So it's not possible to join the PhD program in robotics directly. But yes, uh, most of our applicants to the PhD program in core disciplines like mechanical engineering and computer science uh, are uh, immediately after their bachelor's degree. And while you're here, so I'll tell you a little um, uh, secret, not really a secret anymore, um, is that many of our students are realizing that if they come here to do a robotics PhD, then as they're taking their coursework, if they select them carefully, they can pick up, they have to take a, a 12 courses for their robotics PhD. 10 of those courses can be used to fulfill a master's degree and typically does, but typically people use those 10 courses to fulfill the master's degree in their PhD program. But we've had a large number of students starting to realize that they can pick up the master's degree in robotics while pursuing their PhD in another discipline. Hopefully that answers that. Um, is there more of a trend for mechanical engineering masters in robotics track to go on to PhD versus the robotics MSc? 
Um, that's a good question. There's a much longer history of the mechanical engineering master's degree. So I don't think it's a fair comparison just yet. Our robotics master's degree program uh, has grown rapidly over the last five years, really from nothing in the late, uh, I, I guess the late zeros, to uh, roughly 30 master's degree students uh, now um, in the program. And so I don't think I can make a fair comparison. Um, I do know robotics master's students that are in the program now that are uh, starting to pursue a PhD. So I can't say that without more statistics, I wouldn't be making a fair comparison. But I don't think there's any reason you know, there's absolutely no reason that one, there's no bias in the system that would make it easier for one type of student to do a PhD than another. Absolutely not. Yeah, I think um, also a lot of that has to do with you getting involved in research and getting to know a professor. Um, because I think Noah said this before, where if you are trying to hire a PhD student and you have someone who's already working in your lab and you already know has a good work ethic, as opposed to somebody on paper, then who are you more likely to choose? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's a great point. So um, that's the, re the reason of the two PhD students in my lab that got master's degrees are actually in my lab is because they did well on their courses and they showed a real and genuine interest in working in the lab um, and were diligent in the lab and hardworking and they, they coupled that with good academic performance and so it was an easy choice. Um, will a bachelor's in electrical and electronics, electrical and electronics engineering, I assume, help a student uh, in the master's uh, program. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, my background actually, so I, my PhD, my bachelor's, master's, and PhD are actually all in electrical engineering. Uh, and during my PhD, I studied robotics. Now I'm in the mechanical engineering as the co-director of the robotics program studying biology. So we're a really multidisciplinary tent. Uh, the continuous mathematics that you learn in electrical engineering, electronics engineering, uh, associated with circuit theory and systems theory, communication systems, and so on, like I learned as an undergraduate, are really good, um, is a really good mathematical foundation for robotics. Probably you've also had a decent amount of programming uh, as well. Um, usually in electrical and electronics engineering, you're learning assembly language and so on. Um, so if you have a, a solid programming background, you know continuous mathematics, I can't think of a, uh, of a program that would be better suited for our master's program than ECE electrical and computer engineering or electrical and electronics engineering. There's lots of different types of electrical engineering. More questions? And I should mention, uh, I'm going to go to the next slide here because I did, didn't. You can find more information on how to apply. You can also see my email address here and uh, uh, Allison Morrow. She's the our uh, academic robotics program administrator. Never remember the exact words in her title, but the important thing is uh, she's really good at answering questions about our program, um, and so feel free to either email either of them. I should have uh, Christy's email up here as well, but if you have a question for Christy, please forward it to me or Alice, and we'll make sure it gets to her. And if you don't have any more questions um, now, there is one more thing that I, I want to mention, which is um, how to pay for this program. So. A very natural question that people have, in fact, somebody just uh, asked it right now. Um, actually, two students are asking it, so I was, just, I was just about to answer this. So one student is asking, are robotics MSc students eligible for research assistance that's paid? Yes, they are technically eligible, but I want to not raise your hopes falsely. Most of the research assistantships that we have do go towards um, PhD students, not toward master students. Um, that is not without exception, but that's not the common, it's, it's much more common for students that are PhD students to get paid uh, assistantships. Um, so uh, the likelihood of obtaining a significant portion of your funding paid by any means at Johns Hopkins is very low. And I have to be very clear about that so that you don't sort of have a misunderstanding. Um, uh, I, I do believe that ultimately the degree will pay for itself in terms of both your uh, job prospects and in terms of your long-term career fulfillment, the network that you created Hopkins, but financially uh, you have to find another means to pay for it. And uh, there's, this is similar to this question. Uh, uh, we don't offer uh, funding or scholarships uh, for the program. And uh, this is the same. I'm um, already. Um, one thing I would say is there are part-time jobs available on campus that are very easy to get for students um, and uh, TA positions, which do uh, pay students about 
think it depends on the TA position. Um, I think it's a thousand to three thousand yep. dollars a semester. Um, and so that can be helpful if you need to go towards housing or food. Um, and that's what I've done. And I'm currently a TA. And so that is something that you could use to help offset some of the cost. Yeah, so there, so you can obtain a small amount of funding, um, uh, as Christy says, through things like TA ships. Um, um, if I can mention, Christy also has an internship right now uh, that's giving her some funding, and that's with a, with a, um, a robotics company locally. So um, that's giving her another source of, of, of funding as well. So there are opportunities for, and there's also opportunities we can help we can help you, we can't guarantee, but we can help you try to identify summer internships, um, taking advantage of our network. That often leads to long-term employment, even, although again, I can't promise that, but we definitely work hard to help our students find summer internships as well as future employment. Um, and so those are the ways that we can help you. And that's something that we can do for the rest of your career. So if I don't have any more questions, um, one, one anonymous viewer says, thanks, I look forward to applying. Well, good, we look forward to your application. Uh, please feel free to send me any questions via email and um, uh, I'll uh, try to get to them as quickly as I can. And uh, thanks so much for participating in this call. Start taking, uh, we'll start taking questions uh, now. Let's see, it says, uh, are there any scholarships available for international students? This is a common question, we're gonna answer this live. This is a common question, are there any scholarships available for international students? So in general, um, there aren't, there isn't financial aid for the master's program in general. There are some um, international programs at, uh, that, I, that I know of where students have gotten financial aid from their home country or home institution, but that's not something that Hopkins generally offers to international students until or unless they become PhD students, in which case typically if you're a PhD student, uh, you, you would receive a stipend and, and tuition remission. Um, and uh, so no, that, the answer to that question is, is, is generally no. Uh, another student asks, another candidate uh, asks, I want um, to work on startups and robotics. Is there any kind of support from JHU for these? That's a good question. So uh, there are startups in the area um, and we definitely have good contacts with those startups and can try to um, uh, put you in contact with those. I would say the number of robotics related startups certainly does not match the number of students that we have through the program, um, but that in addition to uh, possible internships at the Applied Physics Lab, um, which would be harder to do for international students because of clearance reasons, um, uh, or local companies or even national companies. Lots of our students do, do end up doing internships during the summer. Um, so there are other venues in addition to just startups. But yes, when there are startups associated with Hopkins. Uh, there is a, a significant effort uh, by this at the university and college of engineering level to uh, engage in entrepreneurial activities. And so there's lots of support for that on campus. Well, also, there's a, the Hopkins Incubator, so if you have an idea that you think can turn into a startup, um, there's a lot of support here at Hopkins, there are, and that's the reason there are so many spin-offs coming from Hopkins itself. Yeah, that's a terrific point. So, any more questions? Um, so uh, one question is, is there a minimum GRE score that's required? So I'm going to answer that. Um, I'll answer that uh, by, well, I'll answer that live. So is there a minimum GRE score? No, there's not a minimum, but certainly this is a competitive program and having strong GRE scores is certainly very helpful. Uh, I think um, a substantial fraction of our um, MSE students that were admitted for this year had GRE scores in the quantitative area. I would say most of them had them uh, higher than 165 out of 170, but that doesn't mean that if you get a lower score than that, that means you're not accepted into the program. We really take the whole picture of uh, what's uh, of that of your entire application into account. Um, and in fact, sometimes things like strong scores in analytical reasoning, I forget the three, quantitative, verbal, and analytical reasoning, um, uh, 
in the other areas is often uh, an extra bonus, right? Because we kind of expect most engineers, scientists, mathematicians to be strong on the quantitative side. And so when you're also strong on these other sides, that can be a bonus. Um, so there's not a minimum, but um, certainly strong performance is important and helpful. Uh, another good question, will the total score matter uh, after it crosses the cutoff? Uh, the answer to that is not really. So I'm going to answer this live also. So I, I think it's important that we maintain, um, that, that I don't think it's a kindness to students who have uh, inadequate preparation in English to admit them into the program, but once they've achieved a certain bar, uh, we don't hold them to a higher standard than that. It's really a, it really is a matter of sufficiency. Um, uh, uh, so that we can be sure that that you'll be able to uh, understand and interpret the material that's provided to you by your instructors. Let's see, if I'm interested in medical robotics, will there be able to work people at your hospital or the medical school? Uh, that's a great question, and yes, there are uh, lots and lots of faculty right here in this uh, building that have graduate students working on projects, uh, both as part of classes like there's a class called CIS, uh, Computer Integrated Surgery, and there's class projects associated with that. And you work on real medical robotics hardware that often involves uh, collaborations with um, uh, the med school. Um, so there's lots of opportunity for that. Uh, do students uh, often change from coursework only to research only? Uh, yes. I just keep that short. That's quite common, in fact. Um, I don't have a percentage for you, but uh, there's certainly a, a good path for that. I have a master's student who's taking uh, one of my courses, and it's my advisee, and he's gotten interested in doing research in my lab, and he's already started up this semester, his first semester. Who knows if he'll end up doing a research essay, but he's certainly getting involved in research uh, from day one. And I think that's, um, I don't want to say that's uh, the rule, but that's something that's available to everybody. Christy, Christina, Christine certainly got involved in research while she was here. And it's, it's really easy to do. I mean, a lot of the professors are very open to new students coming to their labs. So if you email them or go to talk to them, you find their office, and then they'll usually have you attend a lab meeting. Um, and if you are still interested, then they'll talk to you about the projects that they're working on and ask you which ones you're interested in doing. And it's, like I said, very, very easy to get involved. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to answer the slide as well. So now I'm getting a question. If I'm applying for PhD program in robotics, um, uh, will my application be considered for the MSC2? So we do not have a PhD program in robotics. And that's actually something I should have mentioned earlier, and is, is by design. So there are a few PhD programs um, around the US that are in robotics. For example, Carnegie Mellon has been around for a long time uh, and they offer a PhD in robotics. Um, we have chosen quite deliberately not to at this point. We feel like they, um, there's a real market and a real value added at the level of the master's degree in robotics where you have a disciplinary expertise in mechanical engineering, or electrical engineering, computer science, something like that. And, and now you want to get this uh, both deeper but also broader multidisciplinary uh, uh, expertise in robotics to transition you to that next stage in your career. Whether it's going to be pursuing a PhD in robotics, but you would do that in our program through a uh, traditional brick and mortar department, mecha mechanical, electrical, computer science, BME, that sort of thing, or um, uh, at another graduate program uh, worldwide. But we do not offer um, the, the masters, the, the PhD, partially because uh, while I think there's a huge market for masters trained uh, in robotics, I don't think the market right now for PhDs in robotics is as high. Even though you might do a PhD on a robotics topic, it's uh, a, a more traditional field as the name on your transcript of uh, like mechanical engineering, say, um, is I think something that ha right now still has a stronger market. Um, so that's why we haven't chosen to do that. Let's see. Um, so there's a question again. Oops. Uh, there's a question again about, roughly speaking, relates to financial aid, TA ships and RA ships. It is possible to do TAs, for example, but the traditional TAs are not going to receive full stipend 
they're going to receive something like a three thousand um, dollar a supplement to their um, uh, as, a, a, as a payment um, and uh, RA ships can also happen but they I, I didn't I don't want to mention them as being a significant possible source of income because I think they're typically fairly uncommon because when I get a research grant to fund a PhD student typically I'd like to fund somebody that I'm going to have in my lab for a few years um, so because I have a limited amount of resources I, I focus that re those resources on PhD students for research um, uh, but that's not always the case sometimes a project comes along where it's a one or two year project and you want to get somebody um, uh, to focus specifically on that and then a master student can make a lot of sense so it does happen but it's not it's I would say that's that's the exception not the rule so I don't want to make that as a false promise um, what undergraduate profiles better suit the program I don't think there's any one uh, but you need to demonstrate a proficiency in a co some combination of the continuous math and analysis that would be associated with a degree such as mechanical, electrical, uh, or um, say BME, even chemical engineering, where you've kind of got an understanding of kind of the continuous mathematics and how to describe the physical world. And then it's very important uh, uh, to understand that there's also a significant software component. Um, one of those things can be learned along the way, but it's really hard to get both. So if you come in without a strong background in, in computer systems and or, and then programming, and or, and you don't have a strong background in basically some uh, continuous mathematics description of the physical world, then you're gonna be in trouble. But if you have a strong mathematical background and maybe a little bit of programming, you can pick up the programming, or if you're a really strong computer scientist that has some exposure to continuous mathematics through some of your coursework, then you can pick up the continuous side of the house. But it's really hard to pick up both. If you, have, if you, have a, if you want to sharpen that question, you can. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, yeah, again, don't post any questions over in the chat. Please post them in the uh, Q&A. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, will finishing the program help me get a PhD program? I, don't know how it um, I think I already answered this. Will finishing the PhD program, finishing the master's program help me get a PhD program at Johns Hopkins? Oh, I don't want to say, it, it, I mean, that really depends on you and the fit. Uh, but I'll, I can just say that a large number of students that have come here to do the master's program have then been picked up by labs to do their PhD, and that's quite common. And, you know, to me, if I see somebody in-house that has established themselves versus somebody that I'm looking at on a piece of paper, and I'm trying to decide, do I admit the person that's here that I see from the performance in my course and my interaction with them is really good, and this other person that also looks good on paper, who am I going to pick? I'm going to pick the person that's here. So there is, I think, all things being equal, there's an advantage to be here. Um, uh, I think this has already been answered. So um, so some of these questions have already been answered in the PowerPoint. Uh, do do you have master's students who do research in underwater underwater robotics? Yes. Um, Okay, just answer that by text. Uh, I think that's I'm going to answer some of these. I'm going to bang some of these out by text. Um, actually, maybe this one I will answer live because it makes me want to bring up a point. So here's a question. Do I need to know which area of robotics I want to focus on when I apply a kind of side when I'm a robot? 
absolutely you can wait. You can wait to decide this, uh, what area of robotics you want to focus on once you come, and you can do that in consult with your advisor. Every incoming master's student is assigned uh, an academic advisor who is a faculty member in the program that sees you through the whole program. And so you can ask them questions. Um, you know, you're really responsible for picking your courses and all that sort of stuff, but you can ask them questions about, um, about the courses, about the tracks, and so on, and try to uh, help you fine tune your decision. And they're incredibly helpful if you're trying to find some guidance into a certain track or into a certain type of field. Um, if you're interested, for example, in bio-inspired robotics and talk to them about the courses that are being offered, um, they can definitely point you in a certain direction if you tell them what they're, they're interested in. Great. Um, so, uh, I can answer that one. Okay. Um, I don't know if they can see the question. So, the question, so the question is Is there no help available for those who lack the skills in physics, math, computer science? And um, when I came in, I definitely had a lacking in the computer science area. And one of the things that you can do, and this is probably true at a lot of universities, is that you can audit. Uh, lower level classes. And so I audited uh, intro to computer programming and um, was really, really helpful in kind of just solidifying my base of general computer programming. So I think that was specific to C and C++. And then those skills can kind of translate to everything else. So I think you can audit a lot of the lower level classes if that's something that you need help with. Yeah, and, and uh, other cases, I've had students come in that maybe we're very strong in computer. I have one very recent example uh, of a master's student who came in uh, with a very strong track record in computer science. And when she arrived, it became clear that she lacked the mathematical um, uh, skills that she needed for some of our um, intermediate to advanced graduate work. So we were just really careful, she and I, in selecting the trajectory through her coursework. So she saw those courses starting in the second and third semester and not in the first semester. So she started with the more CS-oriented courses. Um, I had her uh, do some uh, some online reading, I mean, some reading and so forth offline between semesters to help her get the scaffolding she needed so that she could then succeed in those. We try not to admit anybody who don't think can succeed in the program, but that's based on a combination of things, and everybody comes in with different backgrounds. So that, that we definitely try to help you uh, get to where you need to be once you're admitted in the program. Um, so again, uh, I just want to address, this is the last question that I would address of this source. So I have research in a particular area, I'm going to generalize it, I have research in a particular area, maybe I do or don't have any research experience in robotics, is that going to adversely affect me? Absolutely not. When I went into graduate school in robotics uh, uh, to, to go work in a robotics lab, I didn't have any experience in robotics. It's not expected that when, you know, when you're an undergraduate, you're still trying to figure out what it is you want to do with your life. Maybe by now you realize, I really want to do robotics, but you haven't done a lot of it. That's fine. It's nice if you've had some research experience. It's even maybe even nicer if you've had it in robotics, but it's not that important. What we want to see is somebody who's got a strong record, who's now interested in going into robotics. And that's what this program is for. Um, so let's see, the best, what is the best thing that JG can offer is so you can crowd Hang on, I'm just reading through some of these. Um, I guess I'll answer this one. So is there a GPA requirement? Similar to the similar to the GRE requirement, there is no minimum. It's not like the TOEFL has a minimum. The international exams have a minimum. We want sufficiency. But with the GPA and GRE, it's really kind of a grayer area. I will say that it's it would be pretty rare. I'm going to talk about the U.S. grading system of a four-point scale. It would be pretty rare for a student under a 3.0, for example, to get into the program. Like it's probably not going to happen. I won't say it's impossible. If I got somebody that had a 2.9, but I knew their advisor really well, and they sent me a letter that explained exactly why that was, it could theoretically happen. But it hasn't happened on my since I've known about it, um, uh, and it's unlikely. So I would say if you've got below a 3.0, your odds are slim. Um, you know, obviously to around 3.0, therefore, would be a little bit questionable. And then, um, uh, but if you have a 3.9, that doesn't mean you're going to get into the program. So it's it's uh, 
because maybe you there's some other aspect of your application that you know it's really a balance of, of, of everything so there's no one number that either gets you into the program or that doesn't get you in the program and i know that makes it hard when you're trying to figure out how to apply um, and how many places to apply but um i think if we set a line in the sand we'd miss really good people that had maybe a little bit weaker gpa but had exceptional research or um somebody who, who has a bad day on the gre but otherwise has an exemplary record. If we set a line in the sand, then we suddenly remove our ability to accept people using our better, using broader judgment. Um, um, so a good question. So will approaching professors in advance of the application by email be a good idea? I would say it can be, and it probably won't hurt, but don't feel bad if you don't get a reply. Uh, as a director of a graduate program and of a lab, I probably get this time of year a half a dozen or a dozen such emails a day. And I just can't take the time to answer all of them. I try to, uh, when I can, um, if it seems like an appropriate uh, uh, email, that even, even if it is appropriate, that doesn't mean I have time to respond to it. I can't necessarily reply to all of them. Uh, I would say one thing to do if you're interested in a particular professor's research, Go to their web page and see what it says about graduate students and what they should do if they're interested in applying. The most important, I have a, a statement on my web page about that says that I may not be able to apply, but here's the things that I'm generally looking for, and this is what you should do if you're interested in working in my lab. If you send an email that makes it clear that you haven't even gone through the, done the time to read that, then it doesn't make me that inclined to want to take the time to reply to you, because it's like I gave you all this information and now you're asking me about it. Why are you doing that? So, um, so take the time to research the individual professors that you're interested in and see if they actually have a statement on their web page about, um, about that. So a lot of professors do. And that information is probably also good in your statement of purpose when you're talking about the interest that you have in coming to Johns Hopkins. You can cite individual professors' labs and research that you're interested in continuing to do. That's a, that's a great point. In fact, that's something I highly recommend. Um, uh, when you do email professors, keep it short and sweet. And don't feel bad if you don't get a reply. It doesn't mean that they're not interested in your case. They just have a lot of those emails. And they, we know you're serious once you put in your actual application. And we read those carefully. We read the letters carefully. We read the personal statements carefully and so on. Um, so many, many, many of our students, many, many of our students uh, are international students. And their GPA is on either a 100-point scale or a 10-point scale. There's 20-point scale. There's lots of scales all over the world. Um, you don't need to worry about converting those. Um, if you're from, uh, uh, I mean, we, uh, we have experience in knowing how to calibrate relative to all these different scales. Uh, and we know that each one has its own, just simply dividing by 10 and multiplying by four isn't necessarily the right way to convert a particular university's scale system. And we understand at least on a national by national basis how those scales uh, tend to work. Um, so that's not something you need to worry yourself too much about. Um, I think this is already answered. Um, so, who's already answered this? So, right? I can maybe answer this one. Hmm? I think I can maybe answer this one. This one here? Yeah. So the question is, what is the best thing that JHU can offer that's so unique and should make its MSc students proud? And I think uh, there's two things major, and the first would be the research opportunities that are available here. Um, like I said, when I was uh, giving my part of the presentation, there's so many different things that you can get involved in. And these projects are uh, affect the robotics community worldwide. Um, so some of the things that are being done are is, is really the cutting edge of what's going to happen in the robotics community in the next five, 10 years. Um, and then the second thing, um, I was really impressed with the faculty here. Uh, I was really impressed with um, uh, when at University of Maryland, uh, not to ding University of Maryland too much, but uh, a lot of the professors didn't seem very interested in teaching and the professors here have, have done a really great job of, of being great lecturers and setting up a program and a, a syllabus that 
kind of gives you a great uh, look at that material. And I've learned so much here uh, from just these individual classes. And so I think really the faculty and the research opportunities are great things about Hopkins. So um, not to toot our own horn, but actually one of the most exciting, nice things I heard, one of our undergraduates said, we had, I had an undergraduate from our program who had taken, actually he, he got his master's degree while he was here. And he went off to another very well-known robotics program that I won't name, because I actually <laughs> like those guys. But he, I, uh, when I went up to that program and it was, uh, was giving a talk there, and I had a meeting with uh, with him. I think he took me out for coffee. He was like he was floored by how much better he thought our graduate courses were than the graduate courses at this program. And I thought that was that really made me feel good. And it's something that we really take seriously here. And uh, and I can't tell you that I know why. I just know that all the faculty and all of my colleagues like there's a whole there's a culture about making courses good. And um, and it's something that we take very seriously. Uh, and it's something that we're really proud of. Okay, um, you, I've kept you guys long enough. If you have any further questions, uh, you see my email address uh, there on the website. If you have any uh, questions for Christine, you can send them to me, I'll make sure she gets them. Um, and uh, um, I'm gonna close for now, and I'm happy to take any questions offline by email. And have a great day, and I hope you apply to our program. Bye.